Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. We've got, how do I say, it's, it's a pretty heavy show this week. We talked with President Jefferson uh, about an article, Clay, that you sent to me, afforded me a link, uh, a, a very lengthy article uh, and a very good one. And it, it opened up quite a discussion with Mr. Jefferson about America's narrative. Maybe you want to tell him about the author and, and, and the article I'm referring to. Yes. So uh, our good friend Rick Kennerly, by the way, sent me the link. So I opened it up and read it. It's by George Packer. It's in the Atlantic. It's available free online. And it's called How America Fractured into Four Parts. And he goes on to say in the beginning, which really arrested my attention, and I know it did yours, David, that nations have to have a narrative on that national narratives like personal ones are prone to sentimentality, grievance, pride, shame, self-blindness. There's never just one. They compete and constantly change. And the most durable narratives are not the ones that stand up best to fact-checking. They're the ones that address our deepest needs and desires. And he believes that we don't have a, a, an accepted consensus, common national narrative now, and that's why we're broken. And so then he, he, he pulls this apart into four distinct narratives, which he calls free America, smart America, real America, and just America, and uh, spends some time... Uh, explaining each of them and, and, and putting it within the context of politics since about the time of Barry Goldwater. And then he concludes, as you know, at the end of this um, this really extraordinary article, uh, that it's not clear how this gets worked out, that we're in a cold civil war. Um, that term has been bandied about, but it appears to be true. And we've had a little hot civil war. We had a little hot civil war around the time of the election and again on January 6th, and it's not altogether clear that there isn't more coming. But his view is that we really are a broken country. And why? Because we don't agree on who we are anymore. That uh, the, the it's not just the left and the right. It's not just the Democrats and the Republicans. It's not the Trumpites versus the Pelosiites. Uh, it's, it's deeper, broader, uh, more fundamental than all of that. And that... Uh, the, the crisis is that the, the four narratives are not communicating, that they each sort of say that they are America and the others are imposters or the others are the enemy. And that when this happens, your republic is in a world of trouble. Yeah, that really broke my heart, that, that, that quote that you just read, the, the ending of the most durable narratives are not the ones that stand up best to fact-checking they're the ones that addressed our deepest needs and desires. It breaks my heart because it's true. I can give you two quick examples. I've said this about Jefferson before, but there's the old narrative, which does show our deepest needs and desires, uh, and it was not altogether true. And then there's the new narrative. So the old narrative was that he was this great man, America's Renaissance man, America's da Vinci, uh, almost a universal genius, a reluctant political figure, who nevertheless did extraordinary things for this country and, oh yes, had slaves, but was a reluctant slaveholder and really was one of the good people in this story. And if he could have snapped his fingers and not had slaves, he assuredly would have done so, etc. That was the old narrative. That was the narrative I imbibed when I started down the path of Jefferson more than 30 years ago, that, that, that slavery was in a sense an unfortunate asterisk in his life. The new narrative, the dominant narrative of the academy today, is that Jefferson was a vicious, racist, and slave master who punished and whipped his slaves, even bred them for profit, that he raped one of them, uh, that he was trafficking in race, and that racism is central to any understanding of Jefferson, that it discredits his achievements, that they can't be understood without slavery at the very center of them, and that that he wasn't one of the good guys in this story. He may have had some good impulses, but he on the whole was complacent, and he was the uh, a person who benefited not just monetarily, but in many other ways from this ugly institution, and that he's dangerous because he puts kind of a good face on it at certain times. And so you see that these two narratives can't can't talk to each other. I mean, both of them seem crazy to me, and yet I held one. That's the point, David. I held one for the first 20 years of thinking about Jefferson. I was skeptical of it, but I basically 
looked at the asterisk notion that slavery was kind of an outlier in his life, and we shouldn't let that be a central fact of, of examining him. And, and now more recently, I certainly reject the notion that he is a kind of an evil, vicious racist of the worst Southern variety, you know, kind of dripping with scorn and bigotry, and that he was trafficking in slaves and so on. Um, the truth has elements in both camps. The truth eludes both camps, that even if you don't take the whole man theory, you can't, I think, swallow either one of those narratives any longer without deep skepticism and lots and lots and lots of qualifying paragraphs and footnotes. And the same is true of the American narrative, that uh, that the old narrative was that America is the greatest thing that ever happened to humanity, and that, well, yes, we make mistakes, but we kind of self-correct, and we have periods where we're doing better and periods where we're doing worse, but we're the most generous nation in the world, and we stand for these things, and and on the whole, we, we, we are great presence in the world, and there isn't much to apologize for. That was a narrative, certainly, that I that I read in, in high school, and, and, and wasn't greatly affected or, um, or undermined even in college. And the new narrative, sort of the narrative of what uh, George Packer calls just America, is that America is just another country, maybe a worse one because it's so hypocritical, that it's all about power, it's all about domination, it's all about uh, subjugation. Uh, Native Americans, African Americans, women, people of the rest of the world, our colonial habits that we, we, we put on a good enlightenment rhetoric uh, and that cheers us up, but the rest of the world has seen through the hollowness of our rhetoric long since, and that we really are just a nation, but a worse one, because we pretend that we're better, and that we should not only apologize, but we should get on our hands and beg the world to forgive us for our sins. Well, both of those narratives, as I'm sure you can sense from the way I presented them, David, are unacceptable, that the one that I grew up with I knew it was hollow at the time, but I certainly know of its hollowness now. And yet the other one, that America is a sort of a, um, a fascist state or a, a naked imperial state like Rome at its worst, I don't think that that um, provides anything like the full truth either. And yet these two camps can't talk to each other. They, they, they just get into shouting matches. They're talking at cross purposes all the time. And so this is what Packer's talking about, is that the narrative, the way we describe who we are, where we've come from, those narratives have diverged to the point that there's no longer any room for compromise, debate, or negotiation. And when that happens, you are in a civil war. It may be one without guns, uh, but... Uh, well, I think you've set up pretty well the tone of this week's program. I hope people will uh, listen to it and gain something from it. Uh, and let's go to the show. But before we do, I didn't give you a chance during the program to uh, announce anything that's going on. Your book is out now, isn't it? My book is out. At, I put it in your hands. Yes. One of these days, perhaps you'll read it. I, I, but uh, I'm thrilled with it. It's out. I'm proud of it. I hope people will buy it. Yes, it's about North Dakota, but it's about so much more than that. It's about rural decline. It's about some of these issues, about how the the, uh, it's it's lighthearted in many regards. It's a celebration of the Great Plains in North Dakota, and it's a particularly a celebration of Native Americans and what they can provide for a new future for the Great Plains. And they they can find it on Amazon. Um, and I know you it's a uh, it's being distributed nationally through your publisher, whose name escapes me. But Kohler Press in, in Norfolk, Virginia. It's it's an, on all the usual sites. It's an ebook starting on. Well, when people hear this, it'll already be available as an ebook on Kindle and Amazon and so on. Uh, and then there will be book signings. We're going to do some special programs on this. We've already done one and so on. There are also the winter encampments, one on Lewis and Clark in winter. There's still a few places in that. The other one is on Charles Dickens. But the one that I'm really eager for people to join us on is John Steinbeck's America uh, in the spring of 2022 in Monterey and in the Central Valley of California. You can find all of this at jeffersonhour.com. It's an extremely busy time in my life. And when I, when this article was presented to me by our friend Rick Kennerly, um, I gulped because I have so much else going on. But I read it. I devoured it. I've read it a couple of times now and will again. And, and we'll be leading a forum on it in Bismarck, North Dakota at a university next week. And before we go, David, I want to not just thank you, but thank our good friend, Kevin Miterman of Thompson, North Dakota, the guitar man who produced that great heritage guitar from Red River, 
wood. Uh, he offered it as a gift to the Jefferson Hour to auction. We did auction it. Uh, a man in San Diego bought it. It's now in safe hands. We're going to have him on the show. I hope he will strum a few bars from this great instrument. But you will agree that this was a magnificent gift to the Jefferson Hour. Oh, geez, yeah. So anyone who wants to find out more about the Jefferson Hour can go to the site. Of course, we we need donations, and we're deeply grateful for them. We take no money ourselves. Every week, I think that the Jefferson Hour is more important because I think the, the program that people are about to listen to, David, thanks largely to George Packer and your moderating, provides real clarification about how did we get here and what exactly does it signify? Unfortunately, he doesn't provide a way out. Maybe that's the next article that he will write for The Atlantic. But I think if you're asking yourselves, why are we broken? that this article goes a long way to helping you think about that. So let's listen to the special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and it is my privilege to now speak with President Thomas Jefferson, and good day to you, sir. Good day to you, my dear citizen. I trust, sir, that you are in good health and that all is well at your home, Monticello. You know, so long retired now from the disagreeable business of politics, which uh, I find toxic and a poison to human happiness, but retired as I am to my beloved Monticello, where I'm surrounded by grandchildren and orchards and uh, a small vineyard, and of course my garden and fields, um, puttering with my house to try to perfect it as a Palladian villa, uh, and writing letters to my friends, but not letters of any political significance, none that represent the actual sovereignty of the United States. I, I find that my health problems have disappeared. I had two characteristic health problems in the course of my career. Uh, one was digestive in nature, uh, stress caused probably. I won't go into details. Such things aren't really spoken about in polite company. But they ended with my retirement in 189. And I got good help, by the way, on this question from Dr. Benjamin Rush, the, the greatest uh, medical officer in the United States at the time. And the other issue was uh, what some historians have called migraine headaches. I called them my periodical headaches, whatever they were. Uh, when I got one, and this would happen in times of great historical or political stress, I would retire into a room at dawn with the shades and draperies down and sit in complete darkness through the whole day, unable to read, unable to write, unable to think. And for someone who loved efficiency as much as I did and, and was as productive as I was, a loss of a whole day or two or three to this malady was not only perplexing, but uh, deeply frustrating. And so those were the issues that I had. I had some other little aches and pains and a kind of rheumatism and so on. I needed reading glasses in the last years of my life. But, but generally speaking, I was subject to very good health and certainly much better health uh, when I got out from under the cauldron of, of, of political life. Well, Mr. Jefferson, uh, while it would be very pleasant to speak about your grandchildren and your home and your gardens, and I hope to do that soon. We've had some listeners inquire if we wouldn't spend some time talking about your gardens. This week, the conversation I had planned was a bit more political in nature, uh, are you willing to go there, sir? I'm feeling a little touch of headache, but please, sir, go on. Well, I must tell you that a friend recently encouraged me to read an article by a Mr. George Packer titled How America Fractured into Four Parts. Quite an interesting article, quite a lengthy article. Mr. Packer is a staff writer at a magazine called The Atlantic, and this article is adapted from his newest book, Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal. And he writes about what he calls the four Americas. May I proceed, sir? Yes, indeed. His justification for the article and explanation of these four narratives comes early on. He writes, 
tracing the evolution of these narratives can tell you something about a nation's possibility for change. What are your thoughts, Mr. Jefferson? Does a nation need a narrative, and what is its purpose, and what would your narrative be? We certainly need a common narrative. We aren't a monarchy or a dictatorship or an aristocracy, so we are something like a democracy. We called it a republic, where the people are sovereign and the people govern themselves, and they can't do that if they can't agree upon uh, the outcomes, the, the teleology of their politics, but also agree upon the people that they are, what they represent, what they value, what is their common identity. And so this is, this is vitally important, and I think we were much closer to it in my time than in yours, but I think in all times and in all places where men are free to think and read and, and make up their own minds, that there will be divisions in the narrative there certainly were some in my time. I would be happy to try to sort that out with you. But we did have common purpose, and that common purpose created a, a roughly consensus narrative, and the divisions were such that they uh, challenged that narrative at times, but they didn't crush it. You, you talk, sir, about common purpose one would think that there that would be an obvious uh, reason for Americans to join together in meaningful dialogue. Yes. In 1774 or so, it became clear to most of us that we were going to have to separate from Great Britain, that we were going to have to do the grave thing and declare independence and possibly um, embrace that independence by way of a war. I, we all dreaded this. Nobody wanted this except a few hotheads. I certainly didn't want it. But there was a very widespread discontentment with the mother country, with Britain's policies, with the policies of the court, and even of, of the king, uh, George III. So yes, we had uh, we had some sense of common grievances and, and common needs, and, and even we had developed common resourcefulness to meet some of those challenges and needs. And yet, on the eve of the 4th of July, 1776, I think probably a majority of Americans, if you could have found a way to canvas their views, would have believed that this will probably all blow over like most storms, and that after a rough patch, uh, we would get back um, into a better colonial arrangement with England. I think the number of people who felt that it was inevitable now that we declare full independence and, and vindicate that with the sword if necessary was a relatively small number, and the debates in the Continental Congress were about this. Should we show more patience? Should we try to work it out? Was it too late to work it out? If so, was this the time or should we give the ministry another few months to try to come to its senses and so on? I think we were frightened of the things that we were uh, contemplating in the Second Continental Congress and in the colonies of America. But, but the sense was that, that we were all in this together. And, of course, Dr. Franklin had, had famously said, we must hang together or we will assuredly hang separately. Back to the national narrative, Mr. Jefferson. Now, Mr. Packer writes about our national narrative and the identities of our two major political parties. And he writes, nations, like individuals, tell stories in order to understand what they are, where they come from, and what they want to be. National narratives, like personal ones, are prone to sentimentality, grievance, pride, shame, self-blindness, there is never just one. They compete and constantly change. The most durable narratives are not the ones that stand up best to fact-checking. They're the ones that address our deepest needs and desires. I might quibble with some of that. It seems a little skeptical and even possibly cynical, but, but I won't uh, get in the way of this conversation uh, by that. Um, set of concerns that I might have. Uh, I, let me explain what I think the fault lines were in our national narrative in my time. After that, I would I would much prefer then to talk to you about the greatness and the and the nobility and the hopefulness of our consensus narrative. But but in terms of the fault lines, there were there were several: north and south, 
And this is what emerged at the, at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. The delegates, the 55 men who gathered there, and, and as, as you know, I was not one of them. I was in Europe. I think that they were shocked, frankly, by how deep that division was, that the southern states wanted slavery protected. In fact, they refused to, to, to go on, to, to remain in Philadelphia, if the other delegates attempted in any significant way to disturb uh, the institution of slavery. And so we, I think, uh, were chagrined to realize that we were freedom-loving people who were designing the most extraordinary constitution in human history. And yet at the center of this debate among these, these gifted individuals, there was the question of n North v. South, and, and that was particularly a question of slavery, although it involved economic activity and, and ports and shipping and fisheries and, uh, and infrastructure and a range of other things. The second division at that era, in my era, was East versus West. And frankly, when I became president, I solved that problem largely by sending James Monroe to Paris uh, to work out the problem of the Mississippi River. And he, my protege, James Monroe uh, discovered when he arrived in Paris and met with our um, existing diplomat there, Robert Livingston, that Napoleon uh, was willing to sell us the interior of the continent, to sell us the Louisiana Territory. And when that was consummated in the summer of 1803, we absorbed the Mississippi River. Our sovereignty now extended all the way from the Atlantic to the crest of the Rocky Mountains, and the Mississippi was in fact, entirely an American river now. We didn't have to share it with anybody except the native peoples who were uh, living there in, in sparse and, and scattered populations. And so that problem of the West, the West feeling that it wasn't treated with the same respect as the original 13 states, that problem largely went away uh, with this fortuitous uh, land transaction, the Louisiana Purchase in, in 1803. But that continued to be an issue, and it would become a bigger issue later, as I said, when slavery um, and the Missouri Compromise uh, really um, crippled our national conversation. And then finally, the third division was the one that I was most interested in, and that's the division between aristocracy and democracy, or between a high-toned central government and a more loose confederation of states. And I was a proto-democrat, meaning that I believe the people can govern themselves and should, and that the states are a better uh, jurisdiction than the national government for solving most human problems, and that we should not build an aristocracy, should not have a, a class hierarchy, or should certainly not have kingships uh, and landed and hereditary aristocrats, and that we could really trust people much more than they had ever been trusted. That those debates were were central to our national period, and we and we nearly did come apart. The election of 1800 was uh, the most fiercely fought election before the Civil War, at least. And so I know that that those things probably are inevitable in any society where men are free to think and write. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, before we took our short break, you detailed what you called the fault lines of uh, the American narrative during your time, but you intimated that you had some very positive things to say about it as well. Yes, I should just say to, to conclude all of that, that at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, uh, it was Madison who really had the, the principal insight because the ostensible quarrel there was between large states and small, between Virginia and Pennsylvania on the one hand, and then puny little states like Rhode Island or Delaware um, or Massachusetts, really, on the other hand. And that was uh, central to the to the discussion in Philadelphia, and at times it, it became very rancorous. But Madison said, really, that's not the fault line. We can work that one out, and they did, by having identical numbers of senators for every state and, and uh, proportional representation in the House of Representatives. But Madison said, the issue is going to be slavery. The issue is going to be North and South, and he could not 
unfortunately, have been more right. But to leave all that behind and to talk about the things that, that really matter so much more than that, I suppose the best way people could understand my thinking is to, is to look at my first inaugural address from March 4th, 1801. But I spoke of this wide and fruitful country, you know, with room enough for the hundredth and the thousandth generation. That alone was unprecedented in human history. The fertility of America, this massive fertility, the quality of our soil, uh, the quality of our rivers. The, the Mississippi is one of the world's most perfect rivers. You know, it flows from St. Anthony Falls, away up in the North Country, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico without significant impediments. You know, you could you could put a raft in at St. Anthony Falls and, and, and float it all the way to New Orleans without um, having ever to portage and that it drained so much of the country, you know, the Ohio River and the Missouri River and, and countless others, um, situated right smack in the center of the North American continent. So all of that, the resources, the, the lead mines and the salt mines and the, I'm sure the gold mines and so on that had never been tapped in the history of the world. So all of that, of course. And then I think the 3,000-mile the distance between us and Europe was essentially a guarantor of our national independence and happiness, that Europe was not going to be able to meddle with us easily, that the supply lines for that sort of thing were much too long, that we would always be protected by that distance of the Atlantic. And then if you add to that that we are uh, mostly an, uh, an English-speaking people derived from Northern Europe, people who voluntarily left the old world and came to a new one, who showed that sort of resourcefulness and gumption, uh, that this made us a, a really remarkable people, and they carried with them the, the principles of the scientific revolution of the 17th century and the Enlightenment of the 18th century. The Enlightenment is maybe the most breathtaking and optimistic thing that has ever happened to humanity from the, the earliest records that we possess of the ancient world. And so if you think about all of that, you cannot help but be optimistic that we shared a rough idea of what a Republican government was. Even the high-toned people like Alexander Hamilton did not want a, a full-on monarchy and a full-on aristocracy. They wanted elements of those European systems, but they, they understood that the people were sovereign and that the people would have to be brought into the, the mix in some way or other. And so there was this sense, I think it was best encapsulated by my close friend Thomas Paine when he said, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. I mean, think of that. Uh, he could actually say without blushing that in America we have it in our power to begin the human experiment over again and maybe this time to get it right after all of the tragedies and failures and pogroms and, and economic maldistributions of the old world that in the United States, in our new republic, we might just produce the closest that humans have ever come to a perfection, to a, a society based upon the rights of man. Um, again, slavery being the, the horrible exception to all of this. So when you add up all of those things, you must be optimistic. And I think most Americans felt it. They might not have been able to articulate it, but they felt like people of a new world. And, and Crevecoeur, the French political theorist, wrote a book about this, and he, and he famously said, what is this American, this new man? You know, this, this American is a new man. He's not just a, a transplanted European. He's new. He represents something that can't be explained simply by looking to the models of the old world, that there's been a liberation of the human spirit and human possibility in this transfer from the old world to the new. And I think that spirit was held by a very large percentage of the American people, even those who were not well educated, but they felt it. They felt it and they lived it and it gave them an optimism and a sense of possibility that I think shocked the rest of the world. Mr. Jefferson, I do not want to disagree with your optimism. Uh, it is in my nature to be as optimistic as you, sir, but in America today, there are different narratives about what our nation is and what it should be. And sometimes they clash. 
Back to Mr. Packer's article. He writes, Free America draws on libertarian ideas, which it installs in the high-powered engine of consumer capitalism. The freedom it champions is very different from Alexis de Tocqueville's art of self-government. It's personal freedom without other people. The negative liberty of don't tread on me. How do we reconcile all this, Mr. Jefferson? Well, I don't necessarily think those are bad things. You know, I don't think you hear Dutch people saying, don't tread on me. I don't think Italians uh, are, are loud about their, their, their natural rights that are the gift of the creator. I think this is good in the American spirit. Um, probably at times it's misapplied. Uh, by people that haven't really thought things through or, or realized the blessings of the American system. But, but I think on the whole, this idea central to the American way of life that freedom is the issue, liberty, and that others, including government, do not have a right to intrude upon that freedom or to tread upon it, I think that's on the whole a very, very good thing. And I don't mind if the people are a little volatile uh, and prickly and likely perhaps to overreact along those lines. It's certainly better than the people being sheep and docile in the face of what might be regarded as incipient tyranny. So I think that that quality, that liberty is the central fact of being an American citizen, is a very valuable one. We should channel it. We should train it. We should, we should contextualize it. We should give it a sense of, of nuance we should ground it in the history of ideas and in the history of this country, but we should never repudiate it on behalf of some more orderly system in which people don't uh, have a certain prickliness about the rights of man. In the Declaration of Independence, sir, freedom comes right after equality. And Mr. Packer writes, and that explains for some Americans that this means freedom from government and bureaucrats, the freedom to run a business without regulation, to pay workers whatever wage the market would bear, to break a union, to pass all your wealth onto your children, to buy an ailing company with debt and strip it for assets, to own seven houses or to go homeless. And he argues that this type of freedom gets rid of all obstructions but it is impoverished and it degrades people. What do you say to that, sir? Well, I think that the, that it is possible for people to misapply the notion of freedom. It's 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 a complicated business. So we want here's the goal: we want to create the tiniest amount of government that can do the work that government must do. You know, we're not anarchists. We don't live without government. We can't. It just, it just can't happen given the size of our population. So we're going to have to have some government. Now, we don't need a monarchy or a tyranny or an aristocracy. We don't need a high-toned, centralized, powerful, um, intrusive national government. And, but, but we need some. And so the, the real challenge in culture is to, is to fine-tune this, to figure out how much is enough and how much is too much. And my prejudice is that it often becomes too much when, you're, when your attention is somewhere else, that if you're not careful, government will simply grow and, be, and, and, and strangle human enterprise and human freedom, and it, it sort of grows in the night so that you have to watch it at all times with great vigilance to keep it from doing so. And so I think that, that that's an important American value, but it can be misused. And I think the mistake, perhaps, that some people of your time have made is that they want to lock the country into 1776 when the actual social structure and technology of the country that you live in in the 21st century is so different that that minimalist libertarian states' rights, decentralized form of government can't serve you given the things that any government must attend to, things like security or distributive justice or making sure that technologies don't wind up having an intrusive effect to, for the creation of monopoly, for example, or for the creation of a surveillance state. And so I think that what happens is that people are so enamored of what we did between 1774 and, say, 1809, when I left the presidency, that they want that America 
But what they don't realize is that that was a three mile per hour world in which a musket took 25 seconds to reload a single shot item that wasn't very accurate. And now they're looking at those same values and wishing or even insisting that we adhere to those principles, but those principles existed for a certain time and a certain place. They're universal in that we must always attempt to bring as much freedom as we can for all citizens. But it, my freedom has to share the country with yours and with someone else's. And when you add this social mix together, especially when you accelerate the progress of humankind through science and technology, then you're going to have to make some adjustments. Or to put it in a, in a nutshell, you're going to need more government in your time than we needed in mine. It's simply that um, there's no way around that proposition that we were able to have an exceedingly limited government because nothing much was at stake. Things traveled so slowly. Our technologies were essentially late medieval technologies. The Atlantic was a vast separation between us and the rest of the world. And no single individual could do much harm to others, even if he was bent on doing harm. He had no bomb that could destroy a city. He had no capacity to poison the water supply of New York or Boston or Philadelphia. Um, he, his horse might run down two people in the town square, but it couldn't run down a hundred people. And so the technologies of your time, unfortunately, and I say this with grief and a sense of, of, of chagrin, the social structure and the technologies of your time, the pace of life, they force an adjustment towards, unfortunately, a more centralized, more high-toned, indeed more Hamiltonian system. I wish it were otherwise. If people were willing to live in a small compound in Montana and to fence it off and declare themselves to be the Republic of Montana, they might be able to resort to that kind of simple polity. But in a society of, I suppose you have more than 300 million citizens now, uh, that, that system from 1779 or 1802 is not going to be adequate to the exigencies, the challenges, the threats, or even the possibilities of life in the 21st century. And so people, mature people make this adjustment. They may still feel loss, but they make this adjustment. They come to terms with modernity. If you can't come to terms with modernity and you're running around in the streets dressed in breeches and tights with a musket, uh, you probably have missed the whole business of the dynamism of civilization. Mr. Packer also writes about the aggressive new populism in America today and how for many Americans, government has become the real enemy, which reminds me of the old saying, be careful what you wish for. Americans have always sort of had a rebellious mindset. Uh, I bring this up because of what you have just said. We may need more government now. Yes, we have a, an advantage here, the Tenth Amendment, which you know, says that the states still matter. They're still sovereign. Uh, in, in, in many regards, they're the, the location of our public uh, lives, our politics. So we didn't swallow up everything in a national government in 1787. Uh, the Founding Fathers made sure that the Tenth Amendment uh, posited a dual sovereignty, the national sovereignty for certain limited things and then state and local sovereignty for other things. And that creates what in your time, this term did not exist in mine, but that creates what you like to call a laboratory of democracy. And so we really have it in our power to test some of these ideas. You know, what if one state let's say it's North Carolina, or for that matter, Wyoming. What if one state attempted this sort of don't tread on me libertarian system in which there was a, an absolute minimalism of government restraint of any sort? And we'll see how that works itself out over 10, 20, or 100 years. And another state, um, let's call it Massachusetts, or perhaps California, another state might erect a much more powerful and centralized and regulatory government. And we'll see how that works out, both in terms of efficiency and order, but also for the pursuit of human happiness over a period of 10 or 20 
or 100 years. In other words, we have a unique capacity because of our sheer geographic size and the, the dual sovereignty principle that's embodied in the 10th Amendment. We can do this. We can experiment with different levels of government control and see whether people flourish or languish, whether people are happy or miserable, whether people feel enslaved or feel free, whether enterprise um, does well or whether enterprise doesn't have enough props, enough regulatory props to protect itself from predators of one sort or another. This is, this is the genius of America. And then we, we will find out. And so the question is, how can people flourish? Under what systems do people flourish? And I think, frankly, that people in your time say they want uh, an 18th century libertarian style of minimalist government. But I wonder if that's actually true. If Socrates were here to question them, what happens when there's a fire? What happens when there's a riot? What happens when there's an earthquake? What happens when a new technology becomes disruptive of the daily life of the people in your constituency? What happens when another state bullies you or a foreign country attempts to, uh, to, to push you around or, or to coerce your destiny? I, I think a, a Socratic figure, Socrates or someone like him, would ask a series of questions. And I think the people, the very people who believe that no government is best or don't tread on me, would sing a very different song in a time of emergency in their private lives or in, their, in the lives of their states. Mr. Jefferson, I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on these matters this week. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak about them, and I so admire your optimism. It lifts me up every time you share it. I believe in this continent. I believe in this country. I believe in America. I believe in the capacity of average people to find happiness. And I believe, frankly, that we will work these things out and that all pessimism is eventually superseded by the greatness and the great dream that America represents, not only for its own people, but for all of the world. I, I cannot not be an optimist in spite of all of the evidence to the contrary. Thank you so much, sir. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. I am out of tights and wig and buckled shoes. I'm not living in a three-mile-per-hour world. In fact, the proof of that is that I'm talking with David Swenson from about five miles away by some miracle of modern communication technology. The semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour is also in Bismarck, North Dakota, but miles away, and we have found through the pandemic that we can communicate quite quite well, I think, my friend, without being face-to-face. -face. Usually. I uh, know next week we, uh, we have our annual... Fourth of July show, which we pre-recorded with Joseph Ellison. Unfortunately, on that one, I had to speak to the both of you on phones, but it was such a delightful conversation. On this week's conversation, I have to thank you for uh, uh, pointing this article out uh, that George Packer wrote in The Atlantic. For me, after reading it, <laughs> It was really good to talk to Jefferson and get a little dose of optimism because he's always good for that. Can I read you the final quote from Packer's article? Uh, yes, let me just preface by saying this article is in, in, is in the Atlantic. You can get it free online. It's by a man named George Packer who has a book uh, along the same lines and it talks about the fracturing of America and he articulates four distinct American narratives that are competing and that's why we don't have a common acceptable American narrative because we have fissured in the, in the very way we describe our national purpose. He ends it by saying, we remain trapped in two countries. Each one is split by two narratives, smart and just on one side, free and real on the other. Neither separation nor conquest is a tenable future. The tensions within each country will persist even as the cold civil war rages them on. Yeah, it's pretty chilling. I love this article. I read it a couple of days ago. I've been promoting it to anybody that I know. In fact, I'm going to have a forum 
at a local university about it next week, David, in which four uh, historians, theologians, or political scientists are each going to embody one of these four Americas. The first America is free America. It's sort of William F. Buckley's America, uh, you know, that uh, don't tread on me, uh, that, that, that we're fortunate to have a limited form of national government. The second is smart America. That's the meritocracy of the people in our uh, universities um, in uh, Silicon Valley, um, you know, in, in, in places like Silicon Valley around the country, in, in, in our boardrooms and uh, heads of foundations. The, the, the idea that merit, this is Jeff, very Jeffersonian, that merit is the measure of, of human success. The third America is called Real America. And if you want just some shorthand on it, that's Trump's America and Sarah Palin's America. And the fourth America is called Just America. It might just as well be called Justice America, but it's mostly younger people now who are so deeply committed to social justice that they uh, have lost their uh, respect for the ideas of the Enlightenment, that they think that really it's really just about power and dominion and white supremacy and racism and that this has to be combated. It can't be combated through the free marketplace of ideas. It has to be combated by rejectionism and shame culture and cancel culture and so on. I'm caricaturing these a little free America, uh, smart America, real America, and just America. And he sees these four narratives as competing in the in the public sphere, and they and they and they not only can't uh, agree to, about how to debate uh, the issue of of what America stands for at home and abroad, but they don't even want to talk to each other. That they there's no reconciliation to be had. And if you want to sort of locate it in the election just passed. The Trump supporters, let's call them 70 million people, uh, believe many of them that the election was stolen, that he's the rightful president, that, that anything else is some sort of a, a coup d'etat. Uh, and they believe that the other, in this case, uh, let's call them the Democrats, uh, are communists, socialists, un-American, not real Americans, and vice versa. The people uh, of the, the smart class, you know, the, the, the presidents and the faculty of the great universities, Look on the Trumpites as you know, as as local yokels, rubes, people who cling to their guns and their Bibles and so on, and don't really regard them as worthy of debate. And so this article attempts to sort of articulate the these fault lines in America and say how he doesn't he doesn't have an answer, as you know, David. But the question is, how do we get out from under this radical fracturing? of the American narrative, because he believes as I do and have been talking about on this program for several years, unless you have something like a consensus national narrative, you cannot solve the problems that you must solve. Well, these problems didn't come up in the last presidential election. They've been around for a couple of decades. And he talks about that in the article, um, you know, going back to the 70s and stuff. But it's, it's almost as if some force outside of America said, how can I rip apart Western democracies? And, you know, it started with Brexit and then it came to the U.S. in a very big way in this in the last election cycles. That to me is the is, is the issue that has to be talked about. You know, Jefferson talked about common purpose and I asked him about that. It's as if we've lost that that notion of common purpose. You know? you know, I do think that I was glad to hear Jefferson's optimism today. I was a little surprised at the things that were coming out of Jefferson's mouth that he thought we'll get through this, and we always do, and you know that uh, that these things seem more dramatic at the moment than they will see in the rearview mirror, and so on. I love that quality to Jefferson's thinking, and I think he would say that were he here. But the warning signs. Uh, say the warning signs of January 6th's uh, assault on the United States Capitol, um, which this author, Packer, talks about with some derision, I mean, serious derision. I think that those uh, might even check Mr. Jefferson's famous optimism. Let, let me give our listeners just a, a, you know, like a quick uh, example. Uh, so immigration. So we all know that we have a problem of immigration that there are illegal uh, people here who have not uh, gone through the process of becoming American citizens. They don't have green cards. They've infiltrated the country in one way or another. 
Uh, estimates vary be, uh, about their numbers, but let's say 11 to 15 million people are undocumented living in America. And so uh, from time to time, uh, our system tries to to do something about this, you know, to, to engage in comprehensive immig immigration reform. Those always break down on political lines. And so you have someone like Donald Trump come to the presidency and he says, here's the way you solve this problem. You build a gigantic impermeable wall on the Mexican border. That will solve the problem. And millions and millions and millions of people hearkened to that. He, he was elected on that basis, probably more than on the basis of anything else. Let's build this wall. Problem solved. People on the other end of the spectrum say that will never solve the problem. Uh, these walls don't really work. That's not where most uh, undocumented workers come into the country, that it's more complicated because uh, in some ways we do want some of these undocumented workers in, in the building trades and in the Central Valley and in, the, in agriculture, that uh, there are family situations, there are, there are people living in unspeakable tyrannies, they're being bullied and raped by gangs, they're sex trafficking. It's, it's a simplistic idea to think you could throw up a wall and solve a problem that is this deeply complex. And the two sides look at each other across a kind of a wall, a metaphorical wall, and each one thinks the other's nuts. The, the, the people who want an actual physical wall say, yeah, we've yada, 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 we've heard this for decades, don't tell me about the complexity. If you put up a wall, you're gonna solve the problem. And the problems that you can't solve by a wall will solve by equally um, em emphatic uh, solutions to the problem of illegal um, immigration to the United States. And the people on the other side say, a wall is just a moronic idea. It's, 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 it's the worst kind of simplistic thinking. It's such a bad symbol of what America is and has been that this is that no rational person can think that a wall is the appropriate response. And that's what he's talking about, David, is that the, uh, that on something like this, it's a perfect example because it's so visual you know, we can imagine that wall. And and Packer's view is these two groups of people can no longer talk to each other. Whenever McCain and, and Ted Kennedy would come together with a comprehensive immigration reform package, it was rejected principally by the right, but also in part by the left. And that we've lost the ability to, to sit down in Congress and debate things and hammer out some kind of a compromise uh, solution to our problems and that this is getting worse and not better. And then those are only two of the Americas. That's, you know, that's smart America versus real America. But, but these others are equally um, obtrusive to any notion of, of, of consensus building in a free society. Well, I do think the article uh, does an admirable job at making a neat list detailing the divisions in political thought in America. It it reminds me of of a Jefferson quote of uh, how storms are inevitable in nature, and when you're in the midst of the storm, it always looks worse than the next day when you have a chance to assess its damage. What we really need is consensus, and we need seasoned veteran leadership that can bring us there. Consensus is always awkward. People don't get what they want. They get angry. But usually, America is able to weather that. It may take some time. But back to Jefferson. I was so glad to hear his optimism today. He, he provided a lot of that. Yeah, me too. What, but let me ask you. I mean, you, re, you read this article. I'm going to hold this forum next week on it. I'm trying to get everyone um, in the Jefferson Hour world to read this and to think about it. And I, I had some quibbles and some concerns about the article. I don't think that it's, uh, um, that it's, it, it's, it's the answer or, or the perfect analysis of our national issues. But when I do think about the things that divide us uh, as a people, even in, you know, not being able to come to terms with an infrastructure bill, not even to be able to come to terms with who gets to vote and under what circumstances across the country, then I fall into despair. And I'm and when you fall into despair and you're confused and frustrated and and upset, you look for explanations. You look who can provide clarity, who can help me think about this strange, perplexing, and oppressive situation. And when I read this article, I thought that helps. That helps me think about this. What's your view? 
Well, I, I, I just read the article today. I need to read it again because it's quite lengthy and there's a lot there to digest. Uh, first reading, I say, no, he doesn't give us any answers. But what he does do is give us a very clear and comprehensive explanation of where we are and how we got here. And, and that is helpful. He helps me understand a couple of things. I think he's particularly insightful about real America, uh, sort of Sarah Palin's American, and he does call her the John the Baptist for Donald Trump, that she laid the groundwork um, uh, a decade or more ago, and, and then uh, Donald Trump took it farther and, and much more successfully. Oh, but, I think it started with with uh, Goldwater into Reagan, and you know, Reagan is the one who... What was his statement? I'm sure you recall it about you know the the most dangerous words you can hear. Is- <laughs> Reagan, famous. He had he had such a genial way of saying these things. But he said the nine most dangerous words in the English language are "I'm from the government and I'm here to help." And and really that was the beginning of it. You know that 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 was a to me and I'll probably hear it for this, but to me that was a great sin for for him to say that. It was politically very calculated and smart. But it did a lot of damage. If the government is failing, it's our fault. It's not the government's fault. We are the government. And I I think Jefferson would echo that, wouldn't he? Of course. No, I think uh, there are great books on this subject by my friend Rick Perlstein, beginning with a a, a book on Goldwater. But his great book is called Nixon Land. And then he has one called The Invisible Bridge. And more recently, just out, is a book called Reagan Land, and they come to about 3,000 pages of analysis of what's happened in the conservative movement since 1960 until today. Uh, He's brilliant. His name is Rick Perlstein. You can find him on all the usual sites, and I've interviewed him for governing.com. Uh, and he's very clever, and his books are are, are, are wonderful to read. But he, he would agree with you that this movement has been going on at least since the 1950s. A lot of it sort of begins with William F. Buckley and the National Review, and then you have Goldwater followed by Nixon, followed by Agnew, you know, and on and on and on. Newt Gingrich plays a huge role uh, in this story. And in fact, George Packer says Newt Gingrich is the most influential American politician of the second half of the 20th century. But what whatever this is, there is there's a huge part of America that harkens to Sarah Palin or harkens to Newt Gingrich or harkens to um, in a more genial mood to Ronald Reagan and that that his view is that that part of America is usually dismissed by the elites that they're 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 derided, held in contempt, regarded as as beneath consideration and and George Packer's view is you might want to start paying a little attention to them because they're powerful and their grievances are real, even if their expression, if their, if their projection of those grievances into the political arena is somewhat messy and rude. Well, I made a deal with Mr. Jefferson I intend to keep. And, uh, uh, you know, we, this has been a pretty serious program talking about politics and uh, trying to remain uh, calm and fair about it all. Uh, But the next time I talk to Jefferson, I'm going to begin with gardens. Once again, this article uh, was written by Mr. George Packer. Uh, It's titled How America Fractured into Four Parts. It's online at The Atlantic Magazine. Um, And he's got a number of books out. And this is actually from his newest book, which is titled Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal. So leaving this grim (laughs) discussion behind in the couple of moments that we have left, uh, give us something good or tell us what you're up to, Clay. So good news. I think you will agree with me that we feel enormous joy and gratitude in our friend Kevin Meiderman. He's the one who produced that uh, heritage guitar. We had an auction, uh, the proceeds of which came to the Jefferson Hour. It was a tremendous gift of generosity in every way by Kevin. Uh, He's been such a a friend to me and a friend to us. Uh, You know much more about music than I do, and you know the quality of his craftsmanship. So we had the auction. The guitar was sold to a person in California. And I just want to say on behalf of Jefferson, our listeners everywhere, how grateful we are to Kevin for um, his generosity, for his artistry, uh, for his patience. Uh, But this was a, a, a really extraordinary gift 
and I couldn't be more grateful. Kurt Simmons is the generous gentleman who now has a new friend in his house, this beautiful guitar, and I, I had a chance to uh, exchange a few messages with him and asked if he'd be willing to come on the show just to talk for a moment, and he said he would, so we'll have to set that up. Meanwhile, everyone, read this article in The Atlantic. It's available free online. We should have conversations about this. We will do another program. I'm, I'm attempting to set up an interview uh, with George Packer, and if that's possible, some excerpts will appear on a Jefferson Hour soon. But I think it's a vital clarifying lens that will help us figure out what is wrong and why in the United States in the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century. So thanks to all of you. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>